So welcome to the wonderful world of photography. And I think, I think that's what I said earlier is that for many of us, we, we, we just get started in this, but we don't realize that photography has been around for a long, long time. So where did this all start? Well, I'm going to take us right back to the camera obscura. Now this dates back to the ancient Chinese, right back in the fourth century before Christ. One would almost not even believe for one moment that photography could be this old, but it is if you go back and you look at what a camera or what an obscura actually is. In essence, the word photography means darkened room. That's what it means. And, and a camera obscura is a darkened chamber where light enters into the chamber through a tiny little hole. And that is the essence or the basis of photography where we're gonna to start today. The light enters into the hole, the image is inverted, and it projects onto a lighting background, upside down. If you take a box, any box, cardboard box, and you put a tiny little pinhole prick into the one side of the box, and you cut off the back of the box and put some tracing paper on, hold it into place with a rubber band, and hold it up to light, you will see the camera obscura effect. The picture will be upside down, but you will be able to see the picture. And this is the essence of what photography actually is. Photography is in fact quite an easy medium and it's quite an easy medium to learn as well because it only has certain basic factors, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the camera obscura effect is just like this. The little light, the light that is formed, we actually call them circles of confusion. Now that is a, a, a strange name, but it's little bundles of light that actually make up the image itself. So modern photography is really the same. It's a darkened chamber, but the only difference is instead of having a little pinhole, a lens has been put into its place that sharpens the image on the inside of the box or the obscura. The camera obscura has been around for a long time. Yeah, you can see in the 15 and 1600s, camera obscuras were actually used to help artists to be able to sketch perspective. So uh, in this case over here, you'll see the darkened room where the artist is sitting inside and, and the, the sitter or the portrait, the person having the portrait sits outside in bright sunlight. The image is projected upside down onto a translucent background and the artist is able to actually sketch the perspective. Now, anybody who's an artist or, or does painting would know that perspective is one of, and perspective based on distortion and perspective based on foreground, middle ground, background is all difficult to do. Here, the camera obscura helped them. The only thing is they couldn't record an image. They could only use it as an aid. Here's what a camera obscura looks like. So this is a camera obscura in the new Royal Palace at Prague. Um, sorry, of the, uh, the new palace. This is in the old palace in the ruins. And in the rafters, there's a tiny little hole and it lets light through. And at certain times of the day, the light projects onto this back whitewashed wall. And you can actually see the, the, the new palace in full color, just upside down. This is the camera obscura effect. This is what we, this is inside the camera itself. And it's, it, this has become a tourist attraction. We go right back here to the 1600s where a German monk by uh, the name of Johann Zahn created this box. And this box over here, this obscura was used to aid uh, him to actually uh, draw or sketch perspective. So you'll notice that it has a lens on the front and you will notice that it has a mirror in it. This area over here is actually a mirror. So the light enters in through the lens onto the mirror and it projects up where he can actually sketch. This is the forerunner to the camera as we know it today. The negative positive system, which Fox Talbot was working on, this is around still today. Um, sorry, I just wanna go back one if I can. Yeah, all right, I'll skip the slide. This is our all time hero in photography, in my opinion. This is Nisiphore Nipst, and he's a Frenchman who captured the first image this is really the, 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 the very basic basis of photography. Um, he, well, the story goes that uh, he had a camera similar to what we just showed you with, with, that Zahn was using or a box similar to what Zahn was using. And for whatever reason, nobody knows, he took some um, substance called bitumen of Judea. It's, it's a very thick 
tar-like substance and he, and he painted it onto a pewter plate. And he put this tar-like substance inside the camera and he left the camera on the mantelpiece of his apartment and he left for the day. When he came back home, for whatever reason, he took a solution of lavender oil and he washed off this pewter plate. And wherever the tar had hardened because of the sunlight being a bit brighter, um, it had darkened. And when it, wherever the shade was, it lightened. And we ended up getting this negative. And for many, many years, we believed that this was an urban legend, that this actually didn't exist. And then lo and behold, they found it. Not only did they find the plate, I think they found the camera as well. Well, today, this is on uh, display in, in uh, the University of Texas, uh, University of Dallas, uh, sorry, in Texas, and it's behind armored glass, it is so valuable, and it still exists. So it, it still has retained a, a lot of its detail. On the other side of the, of the channel, uh, Fox Talbot was busy working on a negative positive system. Now this guy was a Minji Obaga, so he, he was very clever in the sense that he, as he worked, he tied everything up into patents. But he was completely devastated when he heard that the that Nesiphorin Neefs had actually taken the first photograph. And today his system actually still is around, and in fact, even in digital photography. But this is where photography really took off. This is, uh, is Louis de Guerry, and he took a photograph where he recorded the first person ever in a photograph. And this is the person down here. It was actually a guy having his shoe shone. And because he stood still long enough, the exposure was made. And the moment we were able, as mankind, we were able to record ourselves, photography took off. And into, uh, in, into the whole thing came George Eastman. Now, George Eastman is the founder of Kodak. And it's funny that I can't go through the entire history of photography tonight, but it's fascinating that most of our heroes, or a lot of them, actually ended up committing suicide. And one doesn't really know what causes this. Maybe it's just the chemicals that they, that they found themselves in when they were busy processing in a dark room. I'm not too sure. But for a lot of them, they committed suicide. George Eastman was one of those. Uh, next to his body was written, my work is now done, why wait? Which is uh, well, quite obscene in a sense. When he was asked, where did you come up with the name Kodak from? He said, he doesn't really know. He thinks it's just a, mother, a, a name that his mother quite liked. But he didn't realize that he was starting a corporation that would go forward to be the number one brand in the world. I don't know if you guys can, uh, if any of you can remember, but it wasn't long ago when Kodak was the number one brand in the world. Today, it doesn't exist anymore. His slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. And he introduced flexible film and, and, uh, and cameras to society. A little bit later than that, in the early 1900s, we saw the largest camera ever manufactured. This is called the Mammoth, and it was commissioned to photograph the opening of the Chicago Railroad uh, Company. And one photograph was taken, but it required something like 15 men to actually work the camera. They took one picture, and again, this picture is still on display uh, today. Here is our hero when it comes to modern photography and miniature camera photography. This is Oscar Barnack. He, is, um, he worked for the Leica uh, uh, Corporation. And he was the one, he was the genius behind looking at Kodak's flexible film at that stage that they were using in manufacturing of, of film for movies. And he looked at the movie film and he said, why can't we build a camera around movie film? And he went ahead and he did so. And Leica became one of the great camera brands of our time. And here is, in my opinion, one of the geniuses of photography. And uh, yeah, this is Dr. Edwin Land. He's the founder of Polaroid or instant imaging. This, uh, he was an inventor of note. Photography was not the only thing that he was involved in, but he was out busy taking photographs with his daughter using um, a standard camera and film. And his daughter said to him, Daddy, when can I see the pictures? And his answer was, well, in a week or two's time, she said, why? He said, because the pictures have to go to the lab, the lab has to develop them, and then it has to be sent back to us. And she said, but why can't I see them now? And um, in history, it says that within 48 hours, he had penned the Polaroid system on paper. He went ahead and he introduced it as a, as a commodity into the world. 
He did extremely well out of it. Eventually, Kodak stole the idea from him. He sued Kodak, his company sued Kodak, and it almost folded Kodak in the early days. Once they recovered from that, they once again folded because of digital. So this is where it all happens, because electronic capture now came into the world of photography. Now, when did the electronic camera, when did the digital camera turn up? Now, this is quite fascinating. 1975, that's quite some time ago, if you think about it. Kodak at that stage pioneered the digital system. And the reason they pioneered it was because they could see that they were going to have a problem as a company when it came to using commodity into the, in their processing or the manufacturing of film and manufacturing of paper. At that stage, not only Kodak, but the photographic industry was using huge amounts of gelatin, animal byproduct, in the manufacturing of film. Gelatin was the perfect binder, and it would bind light-sensitive silver onto flexible material to make film and paper. And the photographic industry was abusing and using gelatin like you would never believe. And Kodak could see that there would come a time where they would have to defend this, or there would come a time where there just wouldn't be enough gelatin. So they were looking for an alternative binder and they couldn't find anything else. They threw millions and millions of dollars into research. And finally, they also threw in lots of money into electronic research. Steve Sasson, who worked for them at the time, this is the first digital camera uh, ever. This is uh, the Steve managed to create a digital camera to record an image. And a strange thing happened, but Kodak started to fall asleep on this. And although they pioneered this, and now we're looking back in the 1975, Kodak decided to actually shelve the project and keep it for a rainy day. They, they decided that they wouldn't pioneer digital until they really needed it. But the one thing they didn't bargain on is industrial espionage. And before they could wipe their eyes out, the first commercial digital camera was launched in 1981. By who? Sony. Sony brought out the first digital commercial camera. It was called the Mavica. And I don't know if you guys can remember, certainly the older ones around us can remember these things. These are the sniffy discs that came with these cameras. And yeah, and the camera was commercially available and Kodak was already in trouble. At that stage, they, uh, Kodak launched the 10 million pixel camera in 1990. And I remember this camera costing around about 120,000 Rand on the South African market. Now that was a lot of money in those days, but that is what it would have cost you to actually buy one of these cameras. Now, those of you who own Nikons and Canons, here's something that's interesting. Kodak realized that they could not actually maintain the market. So what they did is they went to Nikon and Canon and they said, you manufacture the cameras for us. We will supply the digital technology inside. And Canon and Nikon yeah, licked their lips and said, bring it on. And they manufactured Kodak cameras left, right, and center. You could either buy it with a Canon lens or with a Nikon lens or a Canon mount and a Nikon mount. But it was in fact, it was in fact Nikon and Canon building the cameras. Kodak were only supplying uh, the, the digital technology inside. But it wasn't long after that, and Kodak, and this I've taken from um, minutes from a meeting where it says that, that Kodak themselves and the chief executives decided that it wasn't a problem with, with digital technology because they just couldn't fathom a world without traditional film. Can you believe that statement today? Today, this company is gone. They, uh, unfortunately, they sold all of their digital patents for 525 million US dollars, trying to avoid bankruptcy, but they couldn't avoid it, and they are gone. And Kodak has left us. So that's a very quick walk through the, um, the history of photography, especially for those of you who have come into photography now, wanting to get into photography. There's, there's a long history, and the reason I've showed you that is because digital photography is merely just a step on from film. Digital emerged out of film. And to understand photography, you've got to understand that a lot of what we do in digital, in fact, came from film photography. So, so here's some interesting facts for you. Firstly, photography is an artistic form if, if you choose to use it for that. But it's based on science, maths, and chemistry because it has been created by mathematicians, scientists, and chemists. 
So a lot of the technology and the understanding of how the system works comes directly from, from this. Not only is it super technical, but it can also be super creative. So it tends to play on both sides. Some people get a big kick out of photography just purely at trying to be as, as technical as possible, trying to be as, uh, from a quality point of view, trying to be as, 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 as best as possible. And others get a great, great kick out of it from a creative point of view and a mixture of the two. It was a seamless thing. You, it's amazing how from film photography we moved into digital and it was as if it just didn't really happen. It just, it just continued the same way. So if you learned on film photography 20 years ago or you're learning on digital today, most of it remains the same, except for the darkroom, of course, the digital darkroom. And here's an amazing thing. Can you, can you imagine George Eastman sitting trying to create this new company called Kodak to sell pictures to the world and to try to tell people that pictures were important. Imagine you could go and wake him up now and say, George, do you know there's a thing called Instagram? And just Instagram alone loads 100 million plus photographs per day that the world enjoys. Isn't that an amazing stat? We're not talking about Pinterest. We're not talking about Facebook. We're not talking about any other form of, of enjoying photography. And today, I suppose, photography is, is, is so embraced by our society. But unfortunately, and that's where we're going today as well, is that many, 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 many photographs live in this digital world and never see the true light of day, which is ink on paper and put onto a wall. But it's an amazing stat. So for those of you wanting to get into photography, here's a few myths I want to help you with, especially when it comes to buying equipment, when it comes to, to, to taking high quality pictures. Here's a few things that people believe. They say that the secret to good photography is number one, you need to own an expensive camera. What a lot of nonsense. You need to own a camera that works, but you don't need to own an expensive camera. That is not, that is not true at all. They also say, let me just go back one, sorry. They also say to shoot great pictures, you need lots of megapixels. Today, the cameras that we can buy have already got lots of megapixels. So buying extra megapixels and spending extra money is actually money wasted. Quality doesn't come from that. They also say that if you want to take great pictures, you just got to learn how to use Photoshop. Photoshop has almost become the swear word in modern photography. You know, when people see a great image, they will ask you, is it or has it been photoshopped? Well, you know, the thing is that Photoshop is part of what we do and it's a fantastic product and it's a fantastic expressive medium and it's technically brilliant. I think we should embracing it and not shouting it down the way some people do. They also say that you need to be able to travel to exotic places to take great pictures. Also, absolute nonsense. Great photographs are everywhere. In fact, there's an acre of diamonds in our own back garden. The trick is that we just have to learn to see. And if you can see pictures, they are everywhere. You don't have to go to find them. I think I would, you know, as a photographer, I would rather take great pictures of something normal than have to travel to an exotic place and take a normal picture of something that's supposedly great, if that makes sense to you. People also say that a camera never lies. Well, that's also nonsense. It's a reality-driven medium, yes, I agree. But I think that the more you can get your camera to lie, the better your results will be. How do you know when it's a good picture that you've taken? Well, it generates interest. People start to ask you questions. What did you, where did you take it? How did you take it? Did you, in fact, take it as if you couldn't? So there's an interest factor. And I think that the closer you can, you can or the more you can move a photograph away from from um, foundational imaging, the more interesting it's going to actually become. So if you look at a camera and what it offers, now these are all the things that a camera does incorrect, which actually creates beautiful images. The one thing is that your lens choice. If you use a long lens, it compresses. It brings the background into the picture, very different to the human eye. And if you use a wide angle lens and you're getting close to your subject, it distorts. Compression and distortion are two things that are part of interesting photography. You're able to freeze and blur motion with your shutter. The human eye can't do that. The camera can. 
you are able to create depth. So photography is a two-dimensional medium and you're able to create depth or depth of field in a picture. And you, be able, you are able to actually manipulate that depth from deep, everything in focus, to shallow, only something in focus. And you're able to do that at choice, as a choice, as you're taking photographs. It's a creative tool. And photography can never ever compare to the human eye when it comes to contrast management. The human eye is brilliant at managing contrast. How bright and how dark something is, that's one thing. But how much detail you have in a shadowed area, how much detail you have in a light area, well, the camera doesn't come close to what the human eye can actually do. And because of that, you can create beautiful imaging. You're able to disguise things in shadows or, or, or disguise things in highlights and create interesting effects. The camera is also completely different and subjective when it comes to color. The human eye sees color based on memory. I don't know if you know this, but when you and I look at something and we see the color, we are analyzing color based on our own memory. The camera doesn't do that. The camera actually records color based on the color that's actually there. And so it's very different to the way we see humanly speaking. Again, a creative tool. Plus with a camera, we're able to expose either overexposure or we're able to create underexposure. We're also able to create angles and parallax, which is uh, by pointing the camera into, into, into strange uh, directions. In fact, just on angles and parallax, one of the things I tell my students to do is if you want to improve your photography, place your camera where you normally wouldn't. So don't shoot from eye level. Don't walk around trying to record reality. Go put the camera where you would least expect it. Put it on the floor, put it way up in a high position and shoot at interesting angles. Shoot along something, not straight onto something. Create interesting angles. And with that, you are going to create parallax issues and distortion is going to come part of it as well. All of these things are important. There's this great saying that says, I photograph things. Because why? Because I love to see what things look like once photographed. Once the camera has taken the picture, that reality image is changed based on the things we've just discussed. And that's what makes photography so exciting. And that's what we should embrace. I've always said that if tomorrow the photography industry comes to us and says, guys, we've got it. We've absolutely got it. We have now created a camera which can see exactly like the human eye. It will record exactly as the eye sees. Well, then I would go and do something else because then photography is going to become boring because that's the day it's gonna become super predictable. The fact that the camera is not perfect is why it is so interesting. All right, so I've got some practical advice to offer you. I'm gonna go through a number of different practical tips with you in, 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 in a moment. I wanna I want actually give you like a little to-do list. And especially for those of you who wanna get started in photography. And like I said to you earlier, whether we are to help you, or I'm here to help you, or whether somebody else is going to help you, or whether YouTube is going to help you, or, or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. This is the, the best way to say it is this is the gospel according to Martin. So this is my opinion. This is what I would like you to see you do. This is what I would like you to put on your to do list to say, I want to get into amateur photography, I want to get into professional photography. Um, but are battling to find out where to start. What equipment should I use? Uh, yeah, what should I learn? What shouldn't I learn? These are going to be the tips that I want to give you based on, on yeah, my walk that uh, has taken 30 odd, uh, taken more than 30 odd years. So before we do that, I'm just going to stop for one moment and I'm just going to take questions from everybody. And then we will go on to the to-do list. After we've done the to-do list, we're going to take a break. And then we're going to come back and look at interesting photographs and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen just for a moment. I think you have to start with the right equipment right in the beginning. And unfortunately, I know this is not practical for everybody, but I certainly wouldn't start photography with a point and shoot camera. So I wouldn't go out of my way to try to, to, to spend as little as possible to get a, a, a camera that is more uh, uh, program mode driven. So more something that you would use for social photography and start with that. Um, and equally, I mean, the, the, 
Today, the phone is a wonderful piece of equipment. We use it a lot, especially in our art photography. But also, the, the, the phone is all automated. It's not going to teach you much. You need to start with the right equipment. And the right equipment for me, you will see just now, would be a camera that has a full manual function control, that you're able to control the main elements of the camera. And I would say the DSLR, which is the digital single lens reflex, or the mirrorless camera system today, would be the right place to start. And I will show you that in a moment. Secondly, understand this. When it comes to quality in photography, the lens is the king. I see so many people go out and they spend money on camera equipment, but what they end up doing is they, is they spend so much on a camera body um, and so much on a tripod and so much on all the other stuff that when it comes to the lens, they throw as little as possible at it. It should be exactly the opposite way around. If you're looking for quality photography, your lenses is where the quality lay. And all camera manufacturers will manufacture different qualities in their range. They will have their amateur range and they'll have their professional range. Wherever possible, especially if it's, if it's high quality photography you're after. So if you're after commercial photography, you're wanting to shoot work for commercial work for magazines or for, for, um, yeah, for, for advertising, then this would be a very, very important point. If you're wanting to shoot landscapes, this would be important. If you're wanting to do art photography, it's not important because art photography doesn't, is not necessarily about quality. It's about, it's about textures and moods. But the lens is the key. So it's, it's, it's the best example I can give you is somebody who, who spends so much money on a suit that they don't have money, that they don't have money left for shoes. So they wear flip flops, you know, and you walk around with flip flops and a suit on. The flip-flops are going to attract all the attention. So, no, that's exactly the opposite way around. Just, if you also, just when it comes to digital photography, remember digital photography has, has been born out of film photography. So it's not that digital just turned up overnight and it was just there. It was born out of the photographic system. This roll of film that I'm pointing out over here is the 35 millimeter roll of film. It's the most successful format in film ever. And the digital, in digital photography, um, the whole aim was to try to get the digital camera's sensor to be the same size as 35 millimeter film. Because you must remember in film photography, if you wanted high quality, you needed to just shoot on bigger format. So the bigger your film, the higher your end quality will be. Well, it's not the same for digital. So for digital photography, you have a choice over the size of the digital chip. Now, many years, uh, sorry, um, a number of years back, I would have said maybe watch out for this. But today, the quality of the chip has got so good that whether you're buying on the left a cropped sensor or whether you're buying on the right a full sensor, you're still going to get good enough quality. So the sensor itself has got sufficient resolution. So what I'm trying to point out to you guys is that the size of the actual chip over here that you're shooting on is different. The crop sensor is a much cheaper camera option. So these will come in at a much better price. And people sometimes turn their nose up to them because they say, yeah, but then it's, it's not better quality. But I can promise you with the software we have, certainly the software we have in Photoshop, where we are able to interpolate pictures bigger and build pixels um, in the software process, the size chip is actually fine. You'll be fine with that. The large sensor is just very handy when you're shooting on things like wide angle lenses, for example. So the whole industry has always wanted the actual chip itself, the size of the chip, to equal the size of 35 millimeter film. It has always been the desire of the photographic industry to achieve that. And so we saw with the development of the chip that the chips, uh, we, yeah, we're always heading towards a 35 millimeter frame format, which is 24 by 36 bit millimeters so what my advice is that if you're starting off in photography and you don't have much money then i would buy a, a crop sensor um, camera and i would rather concentrate more of my effort on the lenses and i would build up to a full sensor but only if i needed it i wouldn't really go and throw all that money at it right in the beginning certainly if i can't afford it your other choice when you're buying a camera is going to be do i buy DSLR on the right, digital single lens reflex, or do I buy mirrorless on the left? Now the mirrorless is a newer camera system where the mirror has been taken out and the camera does not have an analog type viewfinder. 
So both camera systems have their advantages and disadvantages. But me, for example, I prefer the DSLR. I don't mind if the camera is bigger because I quite like working through the viewfinder. And the viewfinder, you can look through a series of mirrors and prisms in order to look out through the lens. I prefer the analog viewfinder than what you get on a mirrorless where your viewfinder is digital. But quality of the photographs are going to be the same because the sensor quality is the same. It's going to be based on the quality of your lens. If you're the type of photographer who travels a lot or you want to do traveling and you're worried about the size of the equipment, then the mirrorless is a great option. But that's going to depend on you. It's more important that you go into the camera store and you hold the camera. Pick it up and hold it. Hold it in your hands. Feel what it feels like. Try to ignore the salesman because when their lips move, they normally lie. So try to just ignore what they're saying and rather you feel what you actually like, what suits you, and you buy based on that. The quality will come in any case in these cameras. And whether you're buying Canon, Nikon, Sony, or Fuji, I promise you there's, there's not going to be much difference. The most important thing for me is that if you're buying secondhand, because some guys you can, you can pick up secondhand deals, sometimes you buy other people's problems, but you can get good deals. Um, just make sure the camera you're buying has got live view. Because some of the earlier uh, um, digital single lens reflex cameras didn't have live view. And I think live view is a really, really important part uh, of photography today. So live view is where you can actually work through the back of the camera have a look at the picture on the back of the camera and you're able to see all of your settings. It works really well for landscape photography. It works well for any photography where you can use a tripod, but you can also use it handheld. It's just not as, as, uh, as comfortable as working through the viewfinder, but it is a very important part of, of your camera choice. Another one which, which you must write down is when you're looking for a camera, try to find one that has a depth of field preview button. It's a little button that sits on the side of the camera just below the lens. And when you press it in, it basically manually overrides your lens. So your lens has got an aperture inside it and this button will force the aperture closed. It actually forces it to close down and it will allow you to look through the camera and to preview the actual depth that you're gonna get when you take a picture. Now, it's often not looked at when people buy. But when you get to a certain level in your photography, you're going to want to be able to pre-see or, or pre-view depth prior to shooting. And this is a very, very handy tool to have. And a lot of the cameras have them, but there's some models that don't. So put depth of field preview on your list. Next point, learn the basics of photography thoroughly. I cannot emphasize this more, you know, Math, science, chemistry, beautiful system packed together um, that works all together. And if you understand how the mechanics of the system really work, and I'm going to just take you through a basic overview now, and you're able to get a handle on that, then moving forward into, into like Daniel said, different types or genres of photography is going to make it so much easier. The worst thing you can do is, is go into photography, miss the basics, sort of stumble your way along through an automated or program mode, continually hope or wish that you are getting a photograph, especially if you're trying to charge money for your photography, uh, hope and wish that you actually get the result you want. Here, the most important thing for me is learn the basics and actually control the situation yourself. It relieves, relieves the stress level and it also puts you into a creative foundational position. Put this high on your priority list and don't get up from the table until you understand it. Once you understand this, you will go forward. There are only three controls in photography. So I want to just tell you newcomers this. Don't let other people mess you around with this. There are only three major essential controls. There's only three things to learn. They work together. They're like the trinity. They work together, these three controls. They are the ISO, that is your sensitivity of your digital chip to light. ISO stands for International Standards Organization, and it's merely a measurement of sensitivity. So it's the digital chip and how sensitive it is to light. It is your shutter, that is the door in your camera that opens and closes to facilitate exposure. And it is your aperture, and that is the, the opening in the lens, which is similar to the pupil of the human eye. These are your three controls. That's it. If you are able to manage these three controls with one another, you are well on your way 
to getting established in your photography. It's just putting this together, you're going to be working with stops and the logarithmic calculations. And this is sometimes where it becomes a little bit difficult to understand, especially the numbers and how they work. Remember, math, science, chemistry. But whatever you do, learn these three. There is another control, but it's not essential. It's called EV. Uh, it stands for exposure value, and it's the light meter in your camera. This is like, um, let me explain it this way. ISO shutter and aperture is like when you're driving a car. They're essential. So it's going to be, it's going to be your, your clutch, your brake, and your, um, and your accelerator. And they have to work together in order to get somewhere. EV or light meter is like the steering wheel. So you can steer wherever you go. No, so not the steering wheel. Sorry, listen to me. EV is like the um, speedometer. It only shows you the results. This is what's happening. So the, so the light meter, you don't have to have it. You can guess exposure. But it's really nice to have it. So if you learn ISO shutter aperture, and then you learn how the light meter works and interpretates light, and you learn how to do exposure compensations and all that other nice stuff that comes with it, you are well on your way. But this is the foundational basics that I'm talking about. This is what needs to be understood. I've had it um, fairly often where I have somebody come into class and uh, when I ask them, where did they hear about us? Why are they there? Eventually the truth comes out in some cases where somebody says, you know what, I've been doing photography for 10 years. I even competed um, at club level, but I've never quite managed to pack these things together. So I'm always guessing and I'm trying to sort of get around it that way. I've got a good eye. I can see good pictures. I'm creative, but I'm just battling with the technical side. Well, that's why I'm saying to you, it's not difficult to understand. Make sure you understand it. Then go forward and start to create interesting images. So the salesman will actually say to you, listen, uh, yeah, use your camera on auto, or use it on program, and let's get out there and start taking pictures. You can learn the rest later. I'm saying to you, no. Learn how to use the camera manually. Learn how to control it yourself. Then everything else can follow after that. That's more important to me. To improve your photography, learn how to shoot in low light. Here's a great tip for you. Do you know that for many amateur photographers, they spend years and years photographing in bright light because it's easy. But if you want to improve your photography, and, and you can ask any of our landscape photographers this question, they will or mention this to them and they would agree. Good photography comes from heavy weather, moody light, darker conditions. That's where it starts happening. And do you know why people avoid it? Because it's either uncomfortable or difficult. Don't avoid it. Get your camera out into low light. Early hours of the morning, last light of the day. Work there. Midday is exclusively reserved for drinking beer and cold wine. It's not for photography. So you can release yourself from that. It is in low light. So quality and direction of light is going to equal your success. The quality you get late afternoons and, and, and uh, and early mornings. It's called the golden hours. And that's when you should be out there. If there's one thing photography is going to do for you, especially for outdoor photography, it's going to, it's going to definitely disrupt your sleeping patterns. But that's fine. It's well worth it. Weather conditions bring along interest. So not only get out into low light, but get out into weather conditions that are interesting. Get out into mist, photograph in smoke, photograph in um, in, in conditions which are not conducive to beautiful weather. These are the, this is where great photography lays, lie. So that would be another tip. And then learn to see and understand light. Now, this is a, a big one. I've been doing photography for what? Nearly 30, 30 odd, 35 years. I can't even remember it was so long ago. Somebody said to me the other day, so you are a master of light. The answer is no. Nobody ever masters light. Light is something that will, when you think you've got it, it's going to throw up a curveball at you. But the best you can do is try to understand its characteristics and work as best as you can with them. Great photographs are made because of lighting. So your lens might be a high quality to capture it. Your mood might be there to give you an interesting picture, but it's the actual lighting that creates the picture. Light can take a mundane photograph and make it into something completely and utterly beautiful in the, in the flick of a switch. It is lighting that you need to work at. And there's lots of tutorials on lighting and practice lighting. That's more important to me. And then, please, I beg of you, 
Learn to work in raw camera format. Your camera, when you buy it, you're going to have an option to shoot in JPEG or you're going to have an option to shoot in camera raw. I beg of you, learn to work in raw. Most people avoid it because it takes lots of extra space on the memory card and because you need specialized software to process it. It is well worth every moment of that. So set your camera to raw and make sure you have the software to develop a raw file and learn how to develop a raw file. There's great tutorials that you will find on YouTube um, and also on uh, like Adobe's website that will take you through how to develop a raw file. It is so important. You know, you can take a photograph, have the camera process it as a JPEG and deliver it to you. Or you can take a photograph in RAW and you go into the digital darkroom and you develop it yourself. When you see befores and afters, you cannot believe what we have available to us. This software is just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just fantastic. You are depriving yourself if you do not do this. You've got to learn to do that. RAW is like the old film photography where we developed in a, in, in, a, in a container and we put the film inside and we developed the film to get the best quality out of it. RAW is exactly the same. It's called the digital negative, except we're working in the, in, in, in the digital space and not in the dark room. So here's the other one. And I, I cannot emphasize this one enough as well. You know how many people want to do photography? They buy a really fancy camera. They even go as far as, as trying to get up into processing of raw files and all of that. And then they walk away from it and they say, this whole electronic thing is not for me. You know, that, that digital darkroom is the other half of photography. You can't ignore it. You, it. It's like buying a roll of film in the old days and then, then saying, I'm going to shoot on film, but you know what? I'm just not going to develop it. I mean, it's just pointless. You've got to learn this part as well. And it's not difficult if it's shown to you and taught to you. Really, it's, it's, it's important and it needs to be embraced. And I'm talking to you, especially the, the older guys now, like myself, who are, who are a bit scared of this technology. Don't be scared. It's actually very easy and, and you'll be able to do that. And then after all of this is said and done, composition comes in. So this is where Daniel had a comment on the rules of composition and stuff like that. Here, I would say to you, learn the rules of composition. As much as some people say yes, but then I'm going to become, I'm going to become predictable. Well, you know, it, it's like, it's like revolting against something, but you actually don't know what you are revolting against. So you want to create a, you, you've got to first learn how to pack things together, and then you can, can become a creative after that and decide how you're going to change it. But not just composition, visual dynamics as well. Edward Weston said this, he said, consulting the rules of composition before taking a photograph is much like consulting the rules of gravity before going for a walk. And yeah, that is such a true statement. You first got to go and learn, you know, the rules of composition have been passed down to us through art itself, not just photography, but through art. There's certain things that work if you do them in a certain way. And we need to learn that so that we can create interesting and, and well-composed pictures. But then I advise you to go further. Start to learn about design, design elements, where you break pictures up based on their, on, on their visual design, or whether they're triangles, squares, circles, all that sort of stuff. And there's lots of information on this as well. Go into that and learn about this too. And from that, you will see your creative influence will start to flow. And then after all of that, you can loosen up completely. Yeah. Picasso said this, Every child is an artist, which is true. The problem is staying an artist when we grow up. And how true is that? So I think with photography, you're going to find that you have an instrument that is technical. It's been designed by scientists, mathematicians, and chemists. The hurdle is getting to actually work it. Once you get to work it, unfortunately, your photography can become very stagnant because you end up then sticking, unfortunately, to the technical side and not the artistic side. Once you learn that, you can actually let loose and you can start to create interesting pictures. Salvador Dali, who said, have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it. I agree 110%. In fact, those of you who enjoy Photoshop, can you imagine what an artist like Salvador Dali would do with Photoshop? I would hate to imagine. I think it would be super creative. So here you can let loose and actually use the camera almost incorrectly to create interesting pictures right at the end before we take a break. I would encourage you now, and Daniel, this is 
also that's going to answer your question. Find a mentor. Find somebody that you can that you can work with or emulate, even if they're not with us anymore. Look in books and and find a mentor and start to work with that. Here's my mentors. One of them is Ansel Adams, one of the greatest photographers that ever walked this planet. Not only was he a brilliant creative, but he was an unbelievable technical person when it came to controlling the photographic system. He developed the zone system, which today is probably still one of the most finest bits of writing in photography when it comes to contrast control. And so Adams, I have followed just about everything he does. In fact, I have a Land Rover with a roof rack that I can shoot from just because of this picture. And it helps a lot. It helps a lot. Uh, Ansel Adams also used to use medium uh, format cameras, but the zone system was developed. I'm showing you this because my eldest son came walking in here while I was putting the presentation together. And he said, who's that, Dad? And I said, that is Ansel Adams. And he says, geez, you're starting to look like him now. And I said to him, yeah, but it's not me you should be worried about. Look at what your mother's looking like in the background. Anyway, we both had a good laugh. Uh, I'm hoping you are having a good laugh as well. Here's one of my other mentors, Henry Cartier-Bresson, French photographer, founder of the Magnum Group, one of the greatest photographers when it comes to portrait photography and documentary photography. I followed everything about this man. I followed all of his exhibitions. Um, both of these guys are no longer with us, but they are, they are close to me. I'm a photographer, uh, I'm an artist or a painter trapped in a photographer's body. So abstract photography just does it for me. Jackson Pollock is one of my all-time heroes. And, uh, and I try to emulate and work quite a lot according to, to, um, to his work. And then Henry Matisse, uh, the, great, the great painter, just for bold colors and distortion. These four people are my mentors. This is who I've looked at uh, as I've walked this, this road. Two of them are painters, the other two are photographers. All of them are dead. I was reminded that as well by my son. So, uh, yeah, goes to say. Lastly, you will find that after all of this, your walk in photography, whether it's professional photography or whether it is as, 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 a, as an amateur photographer just getting into it, your whole walk as you go through now is trying to create a style for yourself. And every person has got a style. You can give 100 people the same camera and you'll get 100 different photographs. 100 people the same camera, 100 people the same subject, you're gonna get 100 different results. You are unique in the way you do things. Once you start to practice, there's certain things you're gonna do in your shooting, in the way you're seeing photographs, in your compositions, and the way you develop photographs, which are gonna become unique to you. And that's important. I was asked the question, I think on the last talk that we had, is what is it that, that I personally would aspire, uh, aspire to in my photography. You know what it is? It's to be able to put an artwork on the wall and not have to sign it. And when somebody walks in, they recognize it because of my style. That for me is the ultimate. And that is a lifelong walk. So that is your list before we take a break. The right equipment, the basics of photography, shooting in, in, in low light, working in the raw camera format, embracing the digital darkroom, uh, composition and visual design, working with that, allowing yourself a creative influence, and then learn to see master light, find a mentor, and practice, 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 practice. And when you think you finish practicing, practice some more. Allow the camera to become a subconscious tool in your hand, and then, I promise you, you can walk on the road for developing a style. What am I trying to say? If you get into photography, this is not going to happen overnight. Welcome to the wonderful world of photography. Welcome to probably a hobby, a career that will keep you busy for the rest of your life. That's what makes it so exciting. I'm gonna just stop sharing just for a moment. Um, would actually appreciate this and more than likely have a giggle when you see it, especially those who have been on the planet a little bit longer like myself. But this is, this is where I started photography. I started with, in fact, not this camera. I started with one of these. This is the old Pentax K1000. I'm sure they were made from tanks from the Second World War. I am sure. This thing, you could actually take it and throw it and still pick it up and shoot on it. 
It is the most basic camera that you could ever wish to have. It's got a shutter, it's got an aperture, it's got an exposure button, and it's got a half a decent needle light meter. But you know, that's all I needed. That was it. That was all I could afford when I got started. You know, photography and I found one another quite by accident. And we've never left one another ever since. But it was all that I needed to get started. And you know what I think really worked is the fact that the camera was basic. So for me to learn the basics uh, was easy because the camera was so basic. And when I see people today buying fancy cameras with, with program modes coming out of their ears, I think it's quite difficult to take a step back and say, all right, well, you know, I'm just going to do what I do, basically speaking. So I used to have a, a handheld light meter, an old Pentax K1000, and I used to dream about cameras like this. This is the Hasselblad system. Um, I remember going into, I say to you, you must go into a camera shop, you must hold a camera, pick it up and hold it, see if it talks to you. Well, I made a, a bad mistake one day walking into a, a camera shop this was actually in Weissels in Durban many years ago when I was in the Navy there. And I walked in and I saw this camera and it looked like a video camera. And the salesperson who was there, who was representing Hasselblad said, come over here, come here, you're a photographer. Touch this, hold this. Oh my God, he should have never have done that. And then even worse, he went and gave me brochures, these Hasselblad brochures. I mean, if you want, my, my late father always said, if you want to market something, sell the sizzle, not the steak. And, and this guy gave me these brochures and they sold the sizzle. Inside there was not pictures of how the camera worked. Inside there was photographs of what were taken with this camera. Oh my God, I collected these, these brochures. I used to sleep with them under my pillow. They were practically, my Bible was next to me on the one side of my bed and these were under my pillow and they would give me very good dreams about photography. And many, many, many years later, I got to own a Hasselblad. And many years after that, we got to own a lot of Hasselblads with a photography school. And when I pick up a Hasselblad, the creative juices just start flowing immediately. So this, is, this became a camera that I sought after. The type of photography I was involved in was very technical. I had a commercial photography studio at a point. I was teaching commercial and technical photography, and everything was about lighting. Take the most mundane subject, and just light it properly and you get interesting pictures. And I loved every moment of doing this. At this stage, it was just the whole fact that you would have a challenging subject with reflections that you had to make look nice, for me was just, was just why I wanted to get up out of bed in the morning and, take, and do photography. I did a lot of fashion and glamour photography, worked for a number of very interesting people who created very interesting hairstyles, but that made for interesting photographs. And I photographed cars for many years as well. Um, so this is one of the, the Z3, which we photographed at good old Hartepierspoetdam. This was a, a photograph that they didn't have money to go and shoot it in Germany. So we ended up shooting it here. And then I also photographed for the arch enemy or rival for, um, yeah, for Audi at the same time as well. So this was all, this was like taking a subject from a studio, but a lot bigger and going and lighting it outdoors. The challenge was enormous, but I loved every moment of it. For nearly a year and a half, I, I photographed purely um, jewelry photography. What a challenge. This was harder than photographing anything else I'd ever come across. But yet, at the end of the day, it taught a lot when it came to lighting and reflections. I also did travel photography, traveled to some very nice places and did travel work. So the career was very full of different genres of photography. Photographing from advertising, and this is not Photoshop, this is actually shooting live. And then this is my youngest daughter. She's now 16, by the way. Uh, this is Leanne, but this is her hatching out of an egg. So I photographed her in a studio, but this is not Photoshop. This was done as a double exposure. So I used cling wrap where she had to press through and I masked off the exposure and then did two exposures, one of the egg and one of her. And she was so young now, she can't even remember it. I showed her the other day, this was her and my photography, and she was completely and utterly upset when she saw, she said, you abused me as a child. Look what you got me to do. Well, anyway, that was part of the learning curve for commercial photography. And then for me, things really changed when this photograph entered into my life. This is a photograph that Chris van der Lende took. He is a landscape photographer. In fact, I had a long talk to him today. He's now moved from Pretoria. He's now moved up into, um, into the Northern Cape. 
He's now in the Namakulan Park. He's built himself a little cottage in the Namakulan Park. He hasn't got internet. He hardly speaks to anybody, but he's living an absolute life of dream now when it comes to, to his photography. But he came in, walked into the studio one day with a, a photograph, and he had brought it in with on, on, a, on an inkjet when they first started printing inkjet. And he said to me, look at what we're doing. We're no longer printing in the darkroom. Look at what they're doing with ink and paper. And it's archival. It's going to last for over 100 years. And that was the day my whole life in photography immediately turned around. And I decided at that stage, once I'd helped him with an exhibition on processing and printing, I decided that that's where I wanted to take my photography. This was the very first art photograph I ever took. This was, like, this was like where I challenged myself to shoot a landscape differently. So for me, this was like breaking all kinds of boundaries coming out of a studio. Today, I look at it and it looks pretty normal. It looks pretty normal. This was also one of the very first images I shot in Mahubu's Kloof um, in art photography. This reminds me of a spider bite. So I, I ended up getting a spider bite. I've never been sicker in my life. I've got, you cannot believe how sick you can get from a spider bite. So whenever I look at this picture, I think back at what it actually cost. This was photographed in KwaZulu Natal. This was um, this was uh, in the in the actual Drakensberg itself, and this was infrared photography that I started doing at that stage. Also, trying to force myself away from technical, high technical studio control into loosening up in photography and available light, and I really battled to do it. I really battled to actually loosen up. Um, Rob, you're going to enjoy this, Rob. This was a photograph. It's actually my, my most successful art photograph at the time. But this is a photograph taken at the Great Ball Dam. So this is my point when I say to you, you don't have to travel far in order to get photographs. You've just got to wait for light and mood. This was a marina at the Ball Dam, which was decommissioned. And, uh, and I, the guy who built this marina, I don't know how he got this right, but, but he decided to build this marina out of steel not figuring out that water and steel don't really work like it together. So the water board decommissioned it. And then before he could take it down, he died. And then his family inherited this, this uh, marina, which eventually turned out to be like just a little ghost town. And I, I think I, I tried to photograph this over 30 times and I never got it right. Because why? We didn't have mood. We didn't have lighting. And then one day, one day this high felt storm came in it did this it like it just emerged onto the dam and the last light of the day caught the windows and actually lit them up as if there was light inside and i got two shots off this one with the lightning bolt and another one and that was it and once and you know, once i had shot this i don't know i just got a, a taste for low light moody photography so i started shooting my abandoned collection and uh, those of you who go onto our website, go and have a look. There's uh, 40 photographs that took something like 13 years to shoot. Uh, not that, yeah, I'm a very slow photographer, obviously, but, but uh, these are all moody images that highlight the beauty in old thrown away things. I photographed this one uh, just down the road from where the other one was actually taken. And I got so into moody stuff. I, I, when I saw old things, it was just the most exciting thing I could ever ever do. None of this was shot with studio light. This was all shot under natural lighting conditions, uh, just using high dynamic range exposures. Again, that was mentioned earlier in the talk where somebody said bracketing. I think, Isaac, you said bracketing. Well, this is HDR where you bracket one exposure for shadows, one exposure for midlight, midtones, one exposure for highlights, and you combine them all using software. So the abandoned collection started to move along very nicely. And, uh, and I continued to shoot it time after time. But I, I decided in this collection not to go look for photographs, but rather have them come looking for me. Because I know I'm a, I, I will control the situation if I actually try to force it. So I'll go make it happen. I'll, I'll, I'll take a shack like this and I'll build it if I have to, to get the shot. That's the, just the, the commercial controlling photographer in me. And I knew that that wouldn't work. So I took a decision and I stuck to it for 13 years. I wouldn't go looking for them they had to come looking for me. So I stumbled across these pictures in time. And when I stumbled across them, they were fresh, they were new. Uh, I had no time to think about it. All I could have time to do was to actually shoot them according to a certain look and feel that I was wanting to get. So 
this was photographed in Alapool um, in Scotland. I think this photograph really highlighted my love for photography and how I, I would do anything to get a shot. So we were in Alapool. I had the family with me. I was doing an exhibition in London at the time and I decided to go to Scotland, take the family with and go and show them Scotland. And although I wasn't expecting to find any abandoned pictures, we were in Alapool and I saw these petrol pumps outside a house and the weather was absolutely beautiful. There was not a cloud in the sky and I just couldn't photograph it because it's boring. Uh, you, you know, the subject might be great, but the light was terrible. And, and I felt almost, almost hurt inside having to, to drive away from, from this picture, knowing that it would make such a good abandoned shot. Well, we drove 100 miles uh, up northwest, uh, yeah, northwest, and we were in a little town called Scowry, and it wasn't long, and the weather started coming in. And I said to my wife, stay here, I'm going back to Alapool. And I drove back to Alapool 100 miles to get this photograph. And I realized at that stage, you know what, it becomes obsessive. Nothing will actually stop you. And uh, having got the photograph, I actually felt, you know what, it was worth, which was worth everything. So... I continued to shoot these abandoned pictures. This, believe it or not, is in the middle of the Namibian desert, and it serves as a, a school, uh, as a school, it's a classroom, um, and it's also a church, and it's also a meeting place. And you'll see the bell outside. And, uh, and it stands way away from, from any other dwelling. It stands all on its own, almost surreal. And uh, again, managed to get this picture on a day which really happy with. This was another one of those photographs which I think really highlights what I will do in order to take a picture. And you know, I, I'm not a dishonest person in any way, but I, I can sometimes be pushed to the limit when it comes to photography. So we were, I was busy trying to photograph um, a, a portfolio of fine art work that I could start to exhibit. And I'd approached some galleries for representation and a lot of them wanted to see what I could do and it was all very difficult. And I wanted to shoot infrared photography and we were, we were shooting at the time in Natal and we were camping. And I think we had camped for nearly three weeks. And I've taken my family with because I, I wanted my family to be part of the experience. The children were very small at that stage and my wife, bless her heart, came along in any case. But we had camped and camped and camped and camped. And Anita said to me, please, can she just have a hot bath somewhere? Is it not possible that we just hire uh, or, or book in at a hotel, just even if it's for one night? Anyway, I, knew, I realized I wasn't going to lose, I wasn't going to win this. So I decided uh, we, we would try a place. And it was, it was the Easter weekend, so everything was full. We managed to find a space that had a room available, and the prices were extravagant. We went into this room, and everything about this room was like, why would you want to pay for this? It had a room divider that was about to fall down, would have killed one of the kids. The shower door fell off. Um, everything was just wrong. Even the carpets looked as if they hadn't been cleaned for years. And I immediately wanted to go back and get my money back, go back to camping. It was cleaner than this. And, and I said to Anita, I'm going. I, we're not staying. I'm not paying this money for a place like this. And as I walked out the door, I saw this picture a few hundred meters from the... Um, from where we were staying or where we were, were supposed to stay. It was overcast weather and I needed sunlight to shoot the picture that you see now. And immediately my mood changed and I looked at it and I said, how long will it take to get sunlight? Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. I walked back inside and I said, you know what? We can stay. And she went and she checked there was hot water and she was so happy and she thought I did it for her. Yeah. But today she knows I didn't. I did it for this shot, for infrared photography. So this, uh, this is a similar picture that I photographed in, in KwaZulu-Natal. This was also in the Drakensberg. And again, I, here the advice is, when you go in to take photographs, don't do it with preconceived ideas. For a lot of people, what they do is they, is they, um, is they get an idea of a photograph and then they go looking for it. And then when they can't find it, they either get upset or they end up shooting something else that doesn't work, trying to force it out. Um, this photograph was taken uh, in the Drakensberg, and when I drove in, I wanted to do landscape photography, but I had this whole idea of how I wanted to shoot forests. And as I drove in, they were doing controlled burning. And yeah, they were 
burning the place and the smoke had filled the sky and they had basically gone and polluted my landscape. And for two days I moped. For two days I was upset about this whole thing. How can people do this to me? Anyway, on the third day I decided just to take the camera and start shooting. And I photographed this one looking up at the trees. But you know what makes it work is all the smoke in the sky. So the smoke in the background actually makes this picture into a higher key, more um, sort of stark look. And then when I saw the result on the computer that night, it started off a whole new collection, which I called Ostia Pattern and started shooting. And I, I was like a kid in a candy store. I felt so bad about this that, that I drove, again, 50 to 60 kilometers to the nearest bottle store to buy the fireman beer. So I bought them, I bought a whole case of beer, I bought ice, and I drove back to them and I made them stop burning and come and sit. And I gave them all cold beer. And they said, why? And I said, because you, you, you've just created beautiful photography for me. Keep on burning and long may it last. So I think circumstances sometimes will, will also help. Um, I said earlier that I shoot a lot of different genres. So street photography for me is also interesting. Graffiti, I absolutely love. Anything's a subject matter to me. Um, this is my wife's in-laws. So, uh, sorry, this is my in-laws, my wife's uh, family. So you will see on the right, uh, her mother, and then in the middle, her father, and then the left is her baby brother. I'm just joking. I'm just, I, I really am just joking. I'll get kicked out if she hears what I'm saying. But so I love this. And from street photography, I was given an exhibition in London called Faceless Society. So this is where faces have been torn off pictures and it questions whether leaders faces should actually be on a wall would they be embarrassed if they see it and i was given this exhibition and uh, ended up photographing most of the work in hillbrow and i ended up having to dress up like a beggar and photograph take a camera and make a camera look like a police radio with an aerial so that i could actually get these photographs taken without losing my camera in the process or worse these Photographs were not taken on an expensive camera. They were seriously, a, a, an expensive big camera would have given away the thing. They were taken on a, a camera that shoots on RAW, but it was a, a, a basic bridge camera. And I managed to get these enlargements right up to 1.2 meters. And we had a wonderful show of these in London called Faceless Society. And the middle one is, um, is Nelson Mandela. I managed to find him on one of the back walls in one of the back alleys in Hillbrow. The one on the right, uh, any of you can remember the scope pinups that are found in Brixton of all places. And Prophet Dube is everywhere. He is everywhere. You will find him and you will find his telephone number everywhere. Very popular dude. I also enjoy photographing portraits, but I like to do environmental portraits similar to Cartier Bresson's type work. This is called The Children of Geluk. It's the very first exhibition I was ever given was this exhibition at the Thompson Gallery in Melville in Johannesburg. And I, managed, I did a whole lot of, of, of photography of not only children, but, but a whole family that I photographed at the time. This photograph is, is still popular today. And this is the mother trying to turn the, ba the, the child's to look into the camera for the portrait. But it made a great moment. This is their grandfather. This is Pietrus, and that's his dog. Macy Kent. And they ended up on the front cover of Practical Magazine, uh, this picture. And, I, and when he got to see it, he didn't even understand what practical photography is. He practically didn't even understand what he was doing on the cover of a magazine. But isn't that just such a nice story? Infrared photography continued as we went along. And I think um, sometimes, and, and we nearly finished with what I want to show you, so just, just bear me out with this, but sometimes photographs do give you a sense of memory. You know, I can go back through my entire portfolio and when I go through it, I can remember moments. And I think that's another wonderful thing about photography is that it, it can create those memories. This photograph reminds me of my youngest daughter, Leanne, who can talk the hind leg off a donkey. And uh, I never photograph with anybody around me. I like to photograph when it's quiet and I like, I, I must be on my own. But we were in the Kusef Canyon in Namibia. We were busy camping on the side of the river. I wanted to shoot infrared photography and the river was in flood. And I decided I'd go and shoot some work down the river. And she said, she's coming with for a walk. And I said, no, please don't come with for a walk because you're going to distract me. No, no, she said, she's coming. I think at that stage, she was probably about six years old, seven years old, can't really recall 
So I said, you can come with, but just keep quiet. Yes, she said she will do that. She packed her water, she packed her picnic bag, and off we went down the river to go shoot pictures. And then she started talking and talking. I started to set up the camera, and I remember so clearly, she said to me, Dad, Mom's very clever, hey? And I said, yeah, how can yes, but I'm busy. And she said, no, but Mom is really, really clever. Now, if you know my wife, she's a wonderful mother, um, but, you know, yeah, academically, that doesn't really interest her. So this was a weird thing that, that Leanne was saying. Then she said to me, but Dad, she's much cleverer than you. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, but just, yeah, we'll deal with this later. And she went on and on. She said, did Mom go to university? I said, well, not really. She said, well, then she's super clever if she's as clever as she is, and she didn't even go to university. Did you go to university? I said, no. She said, well, you can see that. You know, but mom's cleverer than you. And eventually I said to her, what are you getting at? And she said, well, we've been on this road trip for what? It was three weeks or something. And she said, and you've had a few arguments. And every time mom's been right and you've been wrong. And that has stuck with me based on this picture. So forgive me for that. And lastly, this photograph is just to show you that sometimes interesting photographs happen just by chance. On that same trip, uh, a colleague of mine's vehicle broke down completely broke down and we were heading to try to photograph something else so he was he came along just as a support vehicle and he was so upset with the fact that we wouldn't make it at sunset to a certain picture that I wanted to get um, and he was apologizing and apologizing and he said to me it's going to take him a couple of hours to repair the car and initially I was upset and then I turned over and I saw this scene and the light started to move in and I said to him Patrick take as long as you like because right in front of me, this beautiful, simplistic image is busy building. And I ended up getting the shot, and I would not have got it had circumstance not actually dropped in and, uh, and helped. So I'm going to just stop there for a moment, and we are coming back. This specific talk that I've given, the class that I teach, that is a basically sort of works around what we've just had to say today, is the basic to intermediate class. So you'll see it goes through from understanding your camera, understanding the basics, onto contrast, understanding color and color temperature, working with depth, and then situational control. So that is being able to apply control over the picture that you want to get to, as you, or you're looking at getting a certain outcome, composition, and then raw processing. So that all takes, uh, whether you're doing it online or whether you're doing it face-to-face -face late in the year, that takes around about five to six weeks to complete. Three hours a week are the lessons. Um, so you will see the dates and the times are on the are on the website. I've got an online class starting Saturday morning, the end of the week, uh, the end of the month. Sorry, that's the course that Annie said that she can't wait to get started on. There is still a few places on that class. If you're keen, you can come and join us. And the online is actually a very nice way of learning at the moment. It's, it's not just that it's it's convenient. It actually is a really nice way to actually learn. And then there's a classroom class face to face, which we may start in October depending on, of course, what COVID-19 is going to do. And then the other class that I do is an art class, which is completely and utterly different. It's a pity Pia's microphone is not working because she's currently doing that class. So is Jose, and they could probably give you more information. But um, this is where photography or the camera is only used as part of a creative process. And uh, if you watch the webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago, this, that will give you an insight into this type of a of, of photographic art and there's an, uh, there's an online class and there's a face-to-face -face class coming up and it's divided into two lessons there's there's the basic lessons one to five and the advanced lessons six to nine so um, that those are the two classes I mostly teach and then landscape photography which is a master class which I do at certain times of the year um, this is where I'm talking to you from just that you know where we are this is the beautiful Hout Bay and uh, this is our gallery in Hout Bay. I want to do, just say to you, if ever you are in Hout Bay, no, no, if ever you are in Cape Town, no, if ever you are in the Western Cape and you don't come visit, I will find out. So you have to come and visit. Come and have a look and see what we do. I share the space with my daughter. We have a father-daughter collaborative that we exhibit from home, and I'd love to show you around and show you the type of work we actually do. I think photography, when shown on a wall, when printed, it just becomes real. And it just, it, it, it's just a wonderful medium. And then we have a gallery in Cape Town. We're just moving that. That was questions I had right in the beginning. 
Uh, this is our gallery that was in Greenpoint, and um, we're now moving it to Woodstock, so you won't find us there anymore. So thank you everybody for, uh, for allowing me this time this evening and to just share a little bit of insight into getting in photography. I really wish you well, and if you need any assistance, please contact us. Here are our contact details for both our gallery, the new location we are moving to, which will open in September, as well as the photo school. So uh, keep in contact and uh, 